All right. I'm going to give me, uh, Banks, Banks, is there a pretty active, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to be naive and I'm quickly, is there a pretty active corresponding uh, Facebook site for us now that, that post all these things and, and that we can comment on the talks yeah. and things. Okay. Yeah, I'll get more is. involved in that. Okay. And kudos to Banks. He does a phenomenal job on that. I mean, yeah. every single Thank you, well, Banks. Yes. So yeah, I've been putting uh, little summaries of the talks this year and Garrick usually posts the recording on there as well after he puts it on YouTube and um, okay yeah happy to have comments and Alan will typically share it to his oh yeah people so blast it out people see it more thanks uh, thanks it's part we... of the new evangelization tool <laughs> thanks I have a question how do we access the archive of previous fellowship meetings and speakers well, so since COVID, you know, uh, slightly after that, in the spring 2020, we, when we went to Zoom, we have most of those recordings, and probably Facebook is the best place to find them. Um, is that off our website? We're using them Facebook more than the website, not really putting a lot there, but um, if there's something you can't find there, uh, ask Garrick in terms of like the recording. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we started recording pretty early on, didn't we, Dan? Yeah, yeah. We might have missed the first one or two while we were figuring it out. Yeah, I didn't miss many. Dan, yeah. you, Dan, you look like you're in a prison in your backdrop. What's going on there? Oh, that's just my messy office. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you're not incarcerated. No, no, no. Yet. Well, uh, I, I might consider my office a, a place of incarceration once in a while, but there is a door right in back of me over here that I could walk out anytime and go get a cup of coffee. Good to know. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we're, we are recording this too. I'm very excited. We're going to uh, have Gary share some things with us. I'm not going to go deep in his history. Most of you guys know him better than I do. And uh, I'll just say this, that when I joined about 10 years ago, Gary was the acting president that year. And so I always associate his voice with the uh, fellowship. Something about when I hear Gary talk, I'm like, okay, we're, we're in the fellowship. It's happening now. And uh, love listening to, to your voice and your thoughts, Gary, and your wisdom. There was a couple of talks over the summer where um, Gary came on and, and asked some questions or added some comments that were just uh, so rich. He and I had a, a talk after that about um, each one had to do with the presence of God or the Holy Spirit being in you. And when you are with people about the difference it makes when you're acting from mm -hmm. that presence versus your own personality or ego. And, uh, and he said he had a whole, uh, whole bunch of thoughts on that. So I'm hoping we'll hear some of that. He and I have been talking about when he could get on. So been trying to get on his schedule for about six months and uh, excited to have him share some thoughts here near the end of the year and right before Christmas. And uh, so Gary, take it away. I'm happy to have you. Uh, thank you, Bengt. Um, first of all, um, Margaret, I need to ask you, how is Tom? I noticed uh, Sunday in the worship service, he was on the prayer list. Uh, Tom, Tom is okay. Um, he had uh, cancer surgery on December 3rd and um, went back in for a checkup and at that time decided that he would not have further treatment. Um, so he won't be seen again by the surgeon until March. But Tom is a very strong person and he, you all know that. And um, we believe that he's going to be well. Since then, he has broken two ribs and has been in terrible pain. But even so, he manages to get around and is always cheerful. And uh, it's a real blessing to me because uh, I know people who've suffered the opposite of that. And I'm so blessed to have Tom and his spirit. And I also want to say Thank you for asking because this group is terribly important to Tom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, if I may, Gary, jump in. I, Margaret, I'm going to put this out here. I would love to have 
and I'm not the only one we've talked about this. Uh, you and Tom and maybe Chandler join you if you'd like, but you guys share your stories with us uh, sometime in the near future here. That well, would be awesome. Uh, we'll think You've about been, that. Uh, That'd okay. <clears throat> that would be great. That would be a blessing to us. You've been on here very faithfully this year. It's been a, a blessing to us. Thank yeah. you. I hope I made it clear that Tom still needs your prayers. Yes. Please. <clears throat> Margaret, if we were to call Tom on the phone, is there a good phone number? Is there a cell number or something, a preferred phone number that he has that we could call him on? No, but we've had the same number for 58 years. Okay, so then one of them. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's two. <laughs> I'd love for you guys to call him. Yep. He'd love that. Two zero six three two two six two five three. Thank you. Oh no, thank you. Okay, you don't mind. That's going to be on the recording. No. <laughs> and around the world. <laughs> Okay, I guess the silence is my cue, right? Yep. Okay. You're up to, you're up to bat, Gary. All right. Well, uh, Ben, when you were speaking, you used a couple words uh, right off that are central. Um, and we could talk about that the whole time, I think. And that's the difference between uh, personality and presence. And I think there is a huge, huge difference. Um, Personality, I tend to think of in terms of kind of a psychological description of us and people we encounter. And on that agenda and on that scale, um, we either like somebody or we don't like them or somewhere in between on that scale. But presence is not a psychological description, I think. I think for us who are following Christ, it's really a spiritual description. And one's presence is either going to reflect godly character or the opposite. So when you think of presence, uh, first of all, uh, think of the fruit of the spirit, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And you and I both know very, in, we know this very well, that when you encounter someone, you might be either encountering their personality or their presence or a mix. It's, well, it has to be a mix, but um, the presence of a person is what really sticks with you. And the opposite of the fruit of the spirit's presence in us is of course, as Paul lists it out very well, anger, hate, strife, jealousy, envy, immorality, sensuality, and idolatry. And uh, those can have various synonyms too as well. But when somebody is really in their own life, in their own being, living in relationship with God, where his presence is the dominant thing within them and their character, that comes through very, very clearly. Um, last week when Nancy was speaking, it was really interesting and really amazing to me how, how many people really was, I, they were identifying exactly with what she was saying around the issue of abuse. And those who heard me talk know something of my own story in that regard too. And, the tough part of that, I think, is that in the long term and short term both, when a person experiences and suffers abuse uh, from others, especially within their family, um, that cripples the soul. And it makes healthy intimacy very, very difficult to say the least, and requires um, a very special uh, spiritual healing. Um, so I find myself asking in life too, is there an intimate presence 
that can heal a wounded and damaged soul. And I have found in my own experience that there is. Um, I think too, in our culture, uh, a question always comes up and we have to ask it of ourselves. Are we more concerned about being a certain kind of person in personality or are we concerned about being a certain kind of presence no matter who we are and no matter what we're doing? And in my own life, um, it's far more a matter of presence at this point in time and has been for a while and is increasingly so. And I got to thinking back as I was uh, reflecting on sharing with you guys this morning, um, who are the people in my life that have reflected a presence that has stayed with me for the rest of my life? And there were a number of them. Um, one I remember uh, very vividly uh, was in the time that Miriam and I were getting acquainted and she and her folks invited me to their place for dinner in Spokane. There was a gentleman speaking at First Presbyterian Church there in Spokane. His name, you probably have heard of him, his name is J. Sidlow Baxter. He was a Scottish uh, clergy. And I remember sitting around the dining room table that evening as we were all conversing. And there was something about J. Sidlow Baxter Far more, I don't remember anything he said, but I will never forget the presence of his being in that room. And it was a strong presence, but it was a quiet presence. It was an unhurried presence. And I think there are some other adjectives I could probably come up with, but that man's presence stays with me to this day. Another one was when I was in my college years and uh, I had a professor, John Lamont was his name. And what comes to my mind is not anything that was in the classroom particularly, but when I encountered him on, on the campus outside one day and we began visiting and again, it's the same thing, it, I was aware of very different person, a very different personality than Jay Sidlow Baxter. But there was still that resonant, deep well presence that came through who he was. And it was very Christ-like. That left a deep impression on me. Uh, several years ago in Seattle Presbytery, we had an executive, Don Butine. Don was the same thing. And I've been acquainted with different Presbytery executives when they get up on the floor of Presbytery and address the Presbytery's concerns in our ministry and mission. But Don is the one I will always remember because of the presence of Christ in him. And that presence has the ability to penetrate a person physically and psychologically and spiritually and to connect us with Christ. And I think that is really the key piece. Uh, we can talk all day long. We can get excited all day long. We can do this, that all day long. But it is the spirit of Christ within us, united, that makes the impact. And um, I think this is really a lot like what happened when... Um, Philip was going to introduce Nathaniel to Jesus, and he said, hey, Nate, come on over and meet this guy. We found the Messiah. And Nate sits there and he says, yeah, can anything good come out of Nazareth? you got to be kidding. No, he says, no, I'm serious. Come on over. So they went over to where Jesus was. And, um, G you know, Jesus says the first thing, as the way John tells the story. Um, Jesus says, well, what do you know? An Israelite in whom there is no guile. And that Nathaniel is totally taken off guard. Somebody has read his character, his real inside. And he's baffled by that. And he said, how in the world do you know me? 
And um, the word no is, the, there are different words for no. One is, how do you know? The other is, how do you know? Uh, and Nathaniel's saying, man, how in the world are you reading my character? And Jesus says to him, and it's the word, how, how have you experienced me? I've never met you before. How have you ever experienced me? And Jesus said, I saw you when you were sitting underneath the tree over there. And the word see is not just this word to see with the eyeballs, is to see from inside to another person's inside. And those are things that really speak to me. Um, another interesting experience in college, and I never met this person in person, but I saw him in person because he showed up on the campus. His name was Charles Weigel. He was 94 years old at the time. And he is the man who wrote this, the old gospel song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. And he sang that song in the chapel service on campus. And that auditorium seated 3,000 people. And I was nowhere near the front. And I still remember that experience to this day because of the way he sang and then the way he spoke after that. Um, so those, those are a few of those things. Um, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is just touch on various ways of experiencing God's presence. And it can happen in all kinds of different ways. Um, I think of the time that the times in my life when the presence of God has been very real to me. <clears throat> and you, I've shared some of this before a long past, but uh, when I was uh, 14 years old, uh, I had finished my homework at night, was getting ready to go to bed, and uh, so I decided I'll read some scripture. So I was reading in Paul's second letter to Timothy, and this passage just absolutely grabbed my spirit, and it's where Paul says to Tim Timothy, proclaim the word, be instant or be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, you know, all that with, with long suffering. And that grabbed my heart in a way that I was not just reading words and uh, reflecting on something that was interesting. It was speaking to me. And that was the initial moment when I felt called to be in ministry um, vocationally. So I thought, well, <clears throat> I can't just sit on this. I'd better, uh, better go say something to mom, mom and dad. So I went and knocked on their bedroom door and uh, they let me open the door. And I told them what had just happened. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, they heard me, mom was quiet, and dad said, did you ever hear a story about the farmer who was out in the field one day and he looked up in the sky and he saw the letters PC? I said, no. He said, well, he thought it meant preach Christ and what it really meant was plant corn. I thought, well, so much for receptivity on that one. So um, I said, okay, back to my bedroom. I've got to pick up that text and read it again. Maybe I misread something. So I read it slowly again <clears throat> and again, and it was the same resonance. And God's spirit was connecting with my spirit and giving my life direction at that point, which I needed very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, another experience, a uh, different one, when I was in Dallas, uh, going to Dallas Seminary one year before I transferred to Princeton, uh, I was very active in the post-college single young adults group. And uh, I got pretty active in the church that year, and that was a great experience. 
And I remember uh, one Sunday evening after we had had our meeting, going back to uh, the residence where I was on campus, and I went to bed, uh, thinking nothing. And all of a sudden, as I lay there in bed, just in this immense peaceful quietness, a tear rolled out of my eye. And I thought, well, what's the, what is this about? I'm not sad. I'm not weeping over something, a trauma. I would, in fact, I was very peaceful and ready to go to sleep. But I was, <clears throat> I was held by that. And the more I reflected on that, the message came through to me. This was the first time in my life that I ever felt the experience of being loved. I'm 21 years old at that point. First time in my life. And so that, that always has stuck with me. Um, another time of experiencing God's presence was more experiencing God's silence. And um, one of the, it was in uh, 1973. I'd been at Redmond, excuse me a sec. <clears throat> I'd been at Redmond Presbyterian since 1978. And um, there was another fellow that come to the church. He was ordained and we started chatting about, uh, shall we share ministry here together? And um, I thought about that and I thought, well, that could be pretty interesting. And I was at that point seriously beginning to search and pray about a call to a different uh, place. So anyway, um, he was working for a refrigeration company down in Portland. And um, he thought, well, why don't you work with us and we'll do ministry together here at Redmond. So I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. So I actually went down there and interviewed with the company. And uh, that interview, they decided they wanted to hire me. So then I had a decision to make and uh, was working in Harvest for Miriam's older brother at that time. So I thought, well, this was my prayer. Okay, Lord, I've got to decide on what I'm going to do with this. And uh, it was a great learning experience because we tend to go about decisions. And on this side, we weigh the pluses. On this side, we weigh the, what we might feel are the negatives. And then we try to make a good, mature, logical decision. And it didn't work. I couldn't come up with anything that was reassuring, assuring, nothing just absolute silence so this went on for a few days and then the day came when i had to call my friend at the end of that day and let him know what my decision was so i was changing the oil in the truck that morning or, or checking it and i thought okay lord uh, you've had plenty of time to speak to me about this and i have to let jerry know tonight so i'm asking you um by this afternoon, let me know. I know you got things to do today, but let me know by this afternoon. So anyway, um, it was just absolute zero, total silence that day. And I got to that point in the afternoon, I said, well, Lord, you've had plenty of time today to talk to me. I haven't heard you say anything. And then I thought, oh, well, well, isn't this interesting? He's saying nothing to me, one way or the other. And then I thought back to my experience that I've shared with you about sensing that call to ministry and a few other things. And, <clears throat> you know, I said, Lord, you know, what I know is that when you really want to say something to me, you say it and I know it. Uh, but you're not saying anything. So I guess what I'm reading from that is your answer is no in this case and it was really interesting i had the most it, it was really physical i had an immense complete hundred percent peace about saying no so i called my friend i told him no and he was fine with that um i think i've shared with you guys as well how I wound up doing ministry outside the church. 
And that had started to grow inside of me even when I was in Redmond. And I would be asked to serve families outside the church. And I thought, man, this is really an amazing ministry out here because these people are really receptive to ministry and to the presence and spirit of Christ. And that's far greater than what I'm experiencing in the church. So um, I went from Redmond to uh, Shoreline, as you know and pastored up here for another three and a half years. So it was a 10 year time inside the church. And meanwhile, there was always this other going on outside the church. And then um, you'll remember the recession in the, in 70 and 71. Uh, Jack, if you were doing real estate, then you remember interest rates going all the way to 22% for mortgages nobody's buying a mortgage there are a few contracts but um, i've been working in mortgage banking that year so uh, there wasn't any more, any more work to do there and uh, that summer and uh, i think it was summer of 81 no no no, no, no. summer of 80 um, again there i was and i i needed work so I, I'd been reading uh, that summer a book called A Ring of Endless Light by Madeleine Langle, one of her great books. And it was in reading that book that there was a story I came across that absolutely riveted me. And I got to a certain point in the story and I just absolutely erupted in tears and uncontrollably. And what came to me was Yes, this is the ministry specifically that God has called me to do. So I began doing that in 1980 and still doing it. Um, I think another moment for me was a critical one in ministry, generally speaking. And um, I was still in Redmond at the time. And I had a lot of educational stuff inside of my head from Princeton. And that was all good nothing wrong with that <clears throat> but it was really i think wrestling to define the experience of faith for me as i would have it and as i would relate it in ministry and um, it boiled down to this difference between what people struggle with in their lives uh, experientially on a psychological level or a spiritual level or both and I would have to say, I think I was focusing more on people's improving psychologically. And that wasn't working. And so I got to the point one day where I was having a bit of a crisis of faith. And um, my prayer became this. Jesus, you are either who you said you are or you're not. You can do what you said you can do or you can't. You will or you won't. Now, if you are and you can and you will, let's get on with it. Because if you're not and you can't and you won't, I'm done. It's not going to make that much difference. And as soon as I had said that prayer, um, the battle was over. And it was, again, this very deep sense of peace in me that Jesus is indeed who he said he is, and we better get on with it. Um, experientially in ministry, there have been so many different things. Um, one was this past Sunday, um, and I'd been in contact with Bruce and Judy Walker, had in fact talked with him on the phone, oh, probably not more than two or three weeks bef before I actually saw in the paper that Judy had died. And uh, of course, down at Horizon House where they live, um, a lot of COVID restrictions. And so it just made it very difficult to get in there. So I called down there last week after I saw Judy's obituary in the paper and I said, I'd like to talk with Charles Williams because he's the guy that gives clearance to who can come in. And the gal said, well, he's not here anymore. So she gave me somebody else's number and I called that person and never heard back. So Sunday afternoon, um, I had finished a memorial service for a family and I told Miriam, I said, you know, 
after I finish that service, I'm just going to walk in there and see if I can see Bruce. So I did. I drove down, walked into Horizon House, and went up to the uh, gals at the desk, told them who I was. And um, I had tried to come down and never heard back and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, she got on the phone and she called Bruce's room. And he answered the phone. And uh, she said, Gary Barker's here and is asking if he can come up and see you. He said, send him right up. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I went up with masks and all that stuff. So I, I did get to see Bruce. And I hadn't been there more than two minutes when another person walked into the room that I'd never met before, a young woman. And she said, hi, Dad. Well, it's their daughter, Megan, who lives here in Seattle. And she said, I can't, and Bruce introduced her to me and she said, I can't believe you're here. She said, I was talking to mom and um, she said, I needed to be in touch with you. You're here. And so I had a good visit with her and Bruce. Uh, so there'll be a memorial service for Bruce at Horizon House. There'll be a small one coming up on January or for Judy coming up on um, uh, January 7th. Um, another incident that really sticks with me, and I want to say this especially to all of you guys, um, I think every one of us would in one way or another call ourselves evangelical here, uh, I do, and I was asked earlier this year in the spring to do a, a graveside for a family and the director, funeral director told me, said this family has specifically requested that this not be a religious service. Okay. So I uh, got all the information I needed and I went and met with the family. And I was in their home with the wife, her daughter, her son and his wife for three hours one day there was not one religious word used in that entire conversation. But I listened and I listened and I asked questions and I listened. And we dialogued for three hours together. So I had everything I needed and I was ready to go home. And then her demeanor changed entirely and she said, you know, before you go, um, said, I'd like to ask, uh, do you suppose, and she's really pensive and um, very intentional with this. And she said, do you suppose we could conclude the service with that old benediction? And I'm thinking, wait, whoa, whoa wait a minute, uh, benediction? <laughs> uh, Aren't we violating what the rule is here? And uh, so she continued and she said, do you, do you suppose we could finish with that old benediction? So I think it begins, uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. And that's all she could get out. And so I said, yes. And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the count, his light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. She said, yes, that's it. And that's the way she said it. And then she said, that is so peaceful. So we did the graveside service, which was non-religious and then finished with the benediction. And I had uh, two really interesting conversations after that that I won't go into right at graveside. But over and over and over again, um, this issue of its being God's presence in us that dominates who we are as a unique person and does not eliminate it, in fact, enhances it so that who we are as a unique individual is empowered enlivened and engaged because of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, 
man, there's so much to say. I uh, can't say it all. Uh, let me see, what do I want to do here? About presence. Um, I'll share this. This is another moment. It was a teaching moment. And then the reality really came a bit later. But I was taking a class on prayer at uh, St. Mark's Cathedral. It was taught by Jack Gorsuch, who was the, he was an Episcopal priest. He was a rector at Epiphany Episcopal in Seattle at the time. And um, he said something in our class one day that I've always remembered. And it's this, it's very simple. We are so much in God, there is no way out. We are so much in God, there is no way out. And I came across this prayer this week in a little devotional that I use, a guide to prayer for ministers and other servants is the name of it. And this is the prayer, and I guess I'll wrap up with this. Um, Father God, why is it that I think I must get somewhere, assume some position, be gathered together, or separated apart in the quiet of my study to pray? Why is it that I feel that I have to go somewhere or do some particular act to find you, reach you, and talk with you? Your presence is here. In the city, on the busy bus, in the factory, in the cockpit of the airplane, in the hospital, in the patient's rooms, in the intensive care unit, in the waiting room, in the home, at dinner, in the bedroom, in the family room, at my workbench, in the car, in the parking lot, at the stoplight. Lord, reveal your presence to me everywhere and help me become aware of your presence each moment of the day. May your presence fill the non-answers, empty glances, and lonely times of my life. Amen. So I'll throw it back to you. There you go. Amen, amen. Reminds me of the Psalm, I think, 139. Where can I go that you're not there? <laughs> Up to the heights, down to the depths. Um, now, yeah. And that's, that's not just a poetic expression. God's living presence is universal. And intensely personal at the same time. Can I uh, jump in? I mean, this has been wonderful um, for a whole bunch of reasons. So I won't remember. I won't remember them all, but I'll just try and remember the ones that are on the forefront. First of all, a question for Banked and Dan, and from some other part of the leadership group here: Have we had Sean Dunn, D-U-N-N, -N, speak to this group? Does that name sound familiar? Okay, I'm going to get him in here. Uh, he's got an amazing ministry. He lives in Colorado. But the reason I'm thinking of him is because I loved listening to Gary Barkert. That's why I'm thinking of him. And, and let me, his, his ministry is called, oh my goodness, oh, it's going to come to me and I'll, I'll, I'll email you guys afterwards. But he's bringing young people to the Lord to the tune of thousands of day by using this, by using this. And um, these are young people young people, most of whom are probably age 20 and under, that are struggling in life, and they're thinking about ending it, and they're, and they're, and they're all over the country, and um, oh, good golly, the ministry will come to me, but don't, let's not worry about that, but why do I love Gary Barker? Because he knows God's word, he speaks it calmly, he speaks it clearly, <laughs> and I just, oh, I just love you, my brother, because it's um, your voice is like almost listening to the Lord himself talking directly at me. And one of the things I was doing today, anybody know about Sir David uh, Suchet, the Englishman? He, he has an audio Bible that is phenomenal. I was listening to Matthew on audio 
before the fellowship started because here's it's, it's coming up on 10 o'clock here in Minneapolis. But so when it was when it was eight o'clock here, i.e. 6 a.m. there, I was listening to audio of of the book of Matthew read by um, Dr. David Chouze. And and he does it so well, just like you, Gary, because I, I'm an audio learner. I'm an audio learner. And so while I'm looking at the scripture and I'm reading it, I'm listening to the voice of this other man who just speaks it so wonderfully. And it helps me a great deal. Anyway, I just want to say thank you, Gary. I, I, I will connect you offline. We'll have a conversation on introducing you to, uh, to Sean Dunn out of uh, Denver area and what he's doing around the country with the use of an app and the use of this device that are reaching thousands and thousands of young ones that are in real tough situations and bringing them to the Lord. And part of that is online counseling with them in their tough place. And he's got counselors all over the country that answer the phone when these young ones call in from the app. And if I, I, I bet you anything, if any one of these heard my friend Gary listen to them, process and respond to them it will be an absolute blessing so thanks gary i love you brother you're welcome i think another thought occurs to me i probably shared this uh the time that billy boylander was sharing with us about prayer um i think it's many times in the silence of god that we hear God the best. And in our own silence as well, we can, and I, I love this prayer, it's called a Celtic prayer before prayer. And it says, I weave a silence onto my lips. I weave a silence into my mind. I weave a silence within my heart. I close my ears to distractions I close my eyes to attractions. I close my heart to temptations. Calm me, O Lord, as you stilled the storm. Still me, O Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me, within me cease. Enfold me, Lord, in your peace. Gary, um, when you first got going, you, I think you said something like in the early part of your uh, ministry at Redmond, you were, your focus was on helping people to improve psychologically. I think that was more of um, kind of a hope underneath um, because I could see and feel the struggles they were in. And you want that to uh, heal in some way. And I think I was too young, even at that point, to understand that underneath is an ocean, a universal ocean of healing uh, mm -hmm. at the spiritual level for all the psychological turmoil we've got. And we, te we tend to think that we're primarily psychological more than spiritual. Spiritual is more of a component of my life and experience. But no, that, that's who we are as well. That's who God is. We're made in God's image. It's who we are. And the other goes along with it, but um, it's not the foundation of who we are. Thanks, Gary. What a pleasure. You know, a lot of guys in the fellowship might have said in the past 20 years, <clears throat> maybe in a comment or a talk that, the root of all our problems are are spiritual. Now, is is that is that too simple, or is that too broad? Or is there actually, from your point of view, some deep understanding and truth in that statement? I think it's profoundly deep, Jack. Um, it's just we haven't been taught that, and so we. We try to swim in polluted waters of our psyche. 
<laughs> Instead of resting in the perfect pool of God's immense care and love for us and his union with us. You know, the other passage of scripture, it just again and again, it just Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. You know, it, if the branch doesn't abide in the vine, it will never bear fruit. It might be a branch, but it won't bear fruit. Hmm. And the same is true of us. Unless our main connection for the resource of who we are is spirit and the spirit of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, sorry, it's just not going to fly. I'll be on a self-improvement kick. And be struggling and kicking the whole way. Right. A self-improvement kick, excuse me, for inter again and again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Gary, as we uh, wrap up this morning, I want to uh, have a side note out of so much affection that we all have for you and the humility of what you've done for so long. I wanted to acknowledge you and personally let everyone know that tomorrow is your birthday. <laughs> So I want him to have a, a moment of celebrating your life, the service that you have done for so long, the humility and the quietness of who you are as a man, and let us all have a moment to celebrate that tomorrow is acknowledging your life and what you bring to so many. But um, I thought we might have a moment and just sing you the classic song. Ready, <laughs> ready everybody? Oh, my word. Happy birthday, birthday to you. 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 Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Gary. Happy birthday to you. What a motley group. <laughs> no. Cross three right? time zones. Yeah, yeah well, I just don't think it works on Zoom, but the intentions here. What I got was the uniqueness of personality and the union of spirit. <laughs> Of course you did. <laughs> now that reminds us of Joe Baraka and his famous version of the Happy Birthday song. Oh yes, good memories. One one quick question I want to ask you, Gary, is um, I, I'm I was struck by your line of if I'm not if I'm getting it, remembering it correctly of of presence versus personality, and I guess just reflecting on the isolation that the world is experiencing. Um, uh, kind of what are your thoughts about the need to move, uh, I, I guess, move in that direction in light of where we are all at? Yeah, uh, Steve, I think you already do this in your role. Um, we need to hold everyone, whoever we are with, in the spirit of Christ, because he does. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. The world, everybody. Yesterday I met with a Chinese woman, immigrant, and her daughter. The mom is not very much English speaking. And um, I will have a graveside next Tuesday for her husband, and, and there's other children, but for the husband and the father in that family. And they, they're immigrants from China, uh, amazing story. Um, the daughter is a Christian, her family is. And uh, the parents really have never had any real exposure to church and Christianity as you and I know it. But she just, the way that daughter talked about her father takes me back to this love joy peace patience long-suffering humility goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control where in the world does all of that come from if it doesn't come from god and i think to cultivate i'm trying to do this more and more steve just cultivate that mentality that is God's embrace of every human being. 
and not establishing some kind of pseudo criteria in my mind that allows me to look at them as God's child uh, or potentially a child of God. Breaking down the categories that we like to put people into and in re and just reflect on the reality that we are all created in the image of God. Yes. And that's why Brennan Manning's book, uh, Abba, The Cry of the Heart for Intimate Belonging, is an important book for me. Another one is um, Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward, which I'm reading right now, just about finished with. That is one on the 12 steps. It is. Yeah. What I got too, Gary, is that, that, that our just being with others is more important than the particular words we find. Absolutely. It's not about a formula or formulation or a certain, yeah, series of, you know, magic words. Um, step one, step two, step three. Or even religious words, or, you know, sometimes that's almost getting in the way. Yeah. Yeah, Ben, so I, I, think, I think my connection, I, will you inspire me here? I mean, I think my feeling for our prayer for the fellowship is a greater, greater connection in a greater connection in 2022 more than we've had before. Gary, over time, we've talked about that remarkable topic of presence versus personality. And then having a chance to reflect on your words this morning and realizing the presence, presence isn't necessarily about charisma. No, not at all. Not at all. It's really about the depth of spirit that the person is the light that is emanating in their presence mm -hmm. that is so captivating. Mm -hmm. So it's a value to be able to reflect on that in a deeper way this morning as, I, as I've been listening to you. It's yeah. not Your comments nailed it. In a good way. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Gary, we always appreciate uh, the, the comments, your thoughts. I, I chuckle when I think back when you and Mitch went to the Holy Land and, and the reports back from that trip. But as, as our generation is aging, and we are, uh, and we hear about the young in our 20s, but it's almost like it's been a taboo subject of, of the uh, end of the road. Uh, Billy Graham's last book was Finishing Strong. Jimmy Carter is a good example of somebody finishing strong. But it's almost like we used to have to take a test and a course to get a driver's license. Uh, there should be an end of life course that people would be taking th this discussion because it's, it's, so, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And uh, just the fact that Bruce Walker was on my heart this morning uh, right. is a coincidence that goes far beyond coincidence. Um, and God incident. So, so we have those, yeah, we have those connections. Uh, anyway, you, you, your thoughts on how do we get it out of the out of the taboo area and into the let, let's 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 delve into that uh, discussion because you know it could be the bus on the curb next week or it could be twenty years down the line, but it's uh, it's all going to happen. What do you think, Gary? I'm not sure all that you have in mind with that. Um, what comes to mind again is Richard Rohr's book. He talks about falling upward, the first half of life, the second half of life. And it's all about growing up and maturing. Uh, but he has a really interesting, uh, good way of talking about it. Um, I think part of it, Chris, is I don't want to have just religious conversations with people. I want to have real life conversations with people. Um, and trust that God's spirit is active and moving 
And I don't even have to rely on quote unquote biblical language. Um, some of that can come up for sure, but if it isn't couched contextually in honesty in a conversation, then it's just, you know, irrelevant to academia. Um, but I think too, <laughs> you know, I approach this, I'm in this time of my life now and I'm still trying to grow up, you know, it's, uh, and I think that's all of us in one way or another. And that's why this first half of life, second half of life, uh, the biblical language that you would get is dying to self and coming alive to Christ. Um, it's removing self from the driver's seat and becoming a willing passenger. Thank you, because the real life conversation is what it's all about. One of our folks that's been with us rarely at the fellowship, those Sean Petrie, his wife Anna died just about a year and a half ago, Steve, something like that. And, and I'm in touch with him because he comes down to the prayer cabin every now and then, but he's still having a real hard time. Mm. But he's one of the people that uh, I've been involved with in real conversation. So, so your answer to my nebulous question is spot on, thanks. Thank you. It reminds me, Gary, you may remember my story involved uh, a long time at Tizé and uh, mm -hmm having just feeling the presence there. And that was the uh, late eighties, uh, you know, the cold, uh, the wall was still, the cold wall was still there. And brother Roger, who as a Protestant decided to live like a desert father, attracted thousands of young people from Eastern Europe to come and look for something that they were missing. And it was just powerful. And and he would just listen, you know, and when he spoke, there were so few words. There was almost, you know, <laughs> he said so little. And yet you just felt that uh, like you were in the in the presence of God or a holy man. And um, and he used to say, I remember him saying uh, one week in a weekly talk to a lot of young, he's like, you need to find new words. You know, you need to write and communicate to people in a new language, in your language, you know, to your young people, like every generation almost, I think was his idea, you know, uh, needs to rephrase, you know, not just stuck in the King James <laughs> version of uh, stories, you know, and then he would, he would do that. I was so attractive. And then he sent, I didn't get this, but to just now thinking about it, he would send out brothers just to live in places of the world that were like forgotten. And there'd be two brothers living in a slum in, in Africa somewhere in Korea and, and like the Bronx <laughs> and, and um, they weren't, they, they wouldn't do much. They wouldn't preach. They wouldn't, you know, evangelize in what we would think of it, but just their presence there was like a powerful thing. Yeah, I think uh, you just come back to the whole thing. It's, um, if it all comes down to one word, it's presence. And Christly presence, godly presence. That energy. Yeah, and it could be while you're clipping toenails or writing a contract or uh, selling something or well, whoever's across the table from you, right? Mm -hmm. Gary, in uh, knowing your ministry a little bit and knowing how deeply personal you are, and I, I love you for it, uh, has this whole COVID shutdown thing of a year and a half or more now uh, increased the demand on you to provide the unique service that you do to so many? Uh, and, and do you have so, any story or two from the past year and a half of the COVID season that you uniquely saw 
Christ show up and what you did, what you were doing and meeting with, if you could, with others that were going through tough stuff? Um, yeah, I think last year it was harder uh, because everybody was going in this clamp down mode. Yeah. Um, this year it's been actively more intense. Um, this year there's been a real acceleration in assisting families with, you know, death and memorial services. Wow. wow. Um, and we're part of that generation, some of us are. <laughs> part of that generation that's now up up there where we're looking at the short end of the string in terms of time <laughs> so there's been a real increase that way but um yeah right oh gosh alan i i shared a few um let me see i don't know if i've gotten a note or two here elsewhere. I don't I mean, know what I do. I feel like you got to dig. There might have been one on your mind that was right away great. Otherwise, no, the ones I shared with you were the ones that came to mind now. But uh, one, one thing I did write down here is um, we don't have to ask God to be present. He already is. Maybe it's we who need to be present. Yeah. Big, we are meeting next week, are we? Uh, we will be present. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? I'm still uh, got a couple of uh, old faithful fellowship folks have been offering. Uh, you know, I actually, it's funny, Margaret was there and I asked her, I, I reached out to Chandler uh, early in the week, waiting to hear from him. And I thought, you know, maybe he could share some stories and, and Margaret and Tom join in. They could have a whole um, a lot to share after this year, especially, I think. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, we'll be here. We'll be here. Uh, one one I last thing I would say, if I could just jump in, never, ever underestimate God's presence anywhere, mm. anytime. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not right. It's not about all our metrics, our human metrics, you know, size and numbers. And, and it's just not, it doesn't compute. Right. I mean, uh, the other, you know, Gary, uh, sorry, <laughs> we, we should pray and wrap this up. But the other thing you made me think of is there's a book and they made a movie a couple years ago called silence about the early, early Jesuits who went to Japan. Hmm. And there was one guy that stayed there and all the Jesuits in Europe lost touch with him. And long story short, essentially he had, well, then there was a time of persecution. There was an early wave that they accepted them and they actually high level court people in Japan uh, saw it positively, but then that sort of, tide shifted this guy basically went native if you will <laughs> like he he just wanted to live like them and understand them he realized after a time the language we were using didn't translate and like for generations they had been misunderstood um and he just wanted to go deeper and understand what they meant by certain words um that were just not getting there and then, but the people from the outside, the traditional Christian people came and saw what he was doing. They thought he had lost his faith, essentially, right? Um, but he, I think, was in a deeper way just trying to be present. Uh, yeah. Hey, Jim, can you hear us? Yes, sir, I can. <laughs> you able to speak? Why don't you... Uh, uh, give us a, a closing prayer and a benediction for Gary to go forth and be present. Oh, absolutely. Oh, loving father. It's uh, what a, what a pleasure it is to come into your presence today, knowing that you were already present. Uh, sometimes it takes our uh, 
just our movement back into an area of solitude to realize that you are there in your might and you're in your creativity and in your love and your mercy and your provision and all the other elements of who you are that we can describe. And they go so far beyond the words that we have. That is you and you are present. So Father, today we just, uh, we're, we're in awe uh, once again of listening to Gary and, and um, knowing knowing the man and knowing his uh, commitment to you and how he has committed himself to helping others and shepherding them through some, some uh, uh, stringent trials and, and, and tribulations. And yet he is there with that calming spirit and you are there with him, of course. And, and lives are touched and lives are changed. And so we, uh, we thank you for uh, just watching the uh, consistency of Gary and, and, uh, and how he lives each day. And so, Father, um, we just lift him up to you. Um, as he goes forward today and into the days that lay ahead, uh, that you would uh, continue to strengthen him and grow him and expand him and let him know more about you. And, uh, and, and Father, we'll, uh, right now we'll just give you the thanks for what you're going to do because you're not a God who stands idly by. You are a God that is, uh, is moving. Uh, moving in the silence and moving in the activity. And so we just, we just thank you for Gary and, and the ministry of coming alongside, uh, grow it father, if that's your will, but continue to just be with them in your might and in your strength. And so father for, uh, today, this day, we, uh, now known as Christmas Eve, Eve, uh, we, we just thank you that we have a package that we can open daily. Uh, we don't have to wait for a celebration, although we mark this day um, of December 25th, and we just are in awe of the gift that you gave us in Jesus. And so in Jesus is real life, meaning, and being. You've shared that with us. You've shared with us uh, your spirit, uh, Ruach. And so we, we thank you for all the elements of what you are. Allow us this year of 2021 to just have one more glimpse, a new glimpse of who you are. And we'll just thank you in advance for that as well. So in the mighty name of Jesus, we, uh, we close out this prayer and this uh, particular uh, chapter and day of the fellowship. But we thank you so much for what you've allowed to um, occur over these eight decades. And thank you, Father. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your love. And we'll just pray this all in Jesus' mighty, precious, and loving name. Amen. Amen. Amen.